Welcome to the Green Ring, and thanks for watching. This video is seventh in a series of eight presenting a note by note analysis of Wagner's Das Rheingold Scene 2. Built on nearly two centuries of scholarly literature, its massive journey aspires to scan the entirety of Der Ring des Nibelungen to its final note. I hope you'll take this voyage with me, which I'm dedicated to completing. For an explanation of who I am and more on the reasons for this series, please check out my preface video. Its link is supplied below along with those for the other videos preceding this one. We pick up where we left off in Dover's full score on the second stave of page 134, just after Loge reveals Albrecht has already forged the ring. The last chord of resignation holds in the clarinet pedal as Donner expresses what his fellow gods are thinking. Unless they seize the ring from Alberich, the dwarf will enslave them all. Donner's vocal sinks on two nervous spear modules, the first and longer parsed as a duo of chord notes, the first separated by a quaver rest from the briefer second, essentially a chain of reversed melody notes. It recalls that module's dominance in the finale of Loge's panegyric, as well as its role just emphasized in resignation. The Thunderer's vocal caps it with an urgent low ash interval on a major second. This vocal in its entirety rides atop a group of six anxious upward cello flourishes, hints of the English horn's covert role in the revelation of Alberich's magic, each of which completes by falling on intervals from thirds to sixths into pizzicati, making them chagrin pulses. Each of these modules launch on octavo contrabass pizzicati to be lightly punched on the third beat with pizzicato viola quaver chords, a succinct portrait of the edginess with which this news enervates the gods. Meanwhile, the final low woodwind sustained resignation chord sinks on reverse melody notes on dotted minim pedal chords throughout. With the two penultimate chagrin modules on cellos, the woodwind pedal rises harmonically. Over the last two chagrin pulses, the final one shifted to violas, Wotan cries he must have the ring, lifting a sixth into a minim on the word ring, followed by a static ash interval, then a falling seventh on the word haben, mark of Erda's unseen goading through Loge's nudge. Fro grasps they no longer need give up love to get the talisman, his voice tracing a rough outline of the ring, doubled by violins which sketch it on an abandonment triad, only to fall on resignation, much as Loge himself sings it during his panegyric, complete in violins alone with its trill appoggiatura. It should be noted, Fro's passage also echoes that falling, rising, falling composite introduced by Fasold, only just reaffirmed by Loge, reminding us of the lesser god's aching sexual need, which can only be assuaged by securing Valhalla for his wooing, as the fire sprite pointed out just before his panegyric. Ironically, here it subtly hints the gods may yet be willing to abandon Freya, this time in trade for the ring. The fire god leaps in, having led them all exactly where he wants, and crows there's nothing easier. Kinderspiel! Doubled by staccato violas, his vocal outlining the ring, then its direct inversion, meaning a rising triad, it leaded seamlessly to a falling one, a reminder of Wotan's joy in Valhalla, which has become intermingled with race and betrayal. From it, violas plunge on a demi-semi-quavered scale into a dotted minim string pedal, yet another strophe in both voice and orchestra of that down-up-down down sign. Photon asks how this can be done to a crib of his ring lust, distorted as chord notes, and rising air to forth, yet another embryonic hint of fate. Loge instantly barks, Durschraub, leaping up a tritone punctuated with a harsh pizzicato sting across the entire string choir on Raub. His abruptness leaves the rest of the measure silent in order for this outrageous suggestion to sink in. 
Then he softens the blow in what outwardly seems a minor digression that nonetheless includes meaningful hints at the work's overall meaning, both verbal and syntactic. These staves, as marked with their specific instruments, reproduce every line in the passage's orchestration, which, though compact, is especially dense in evolving syntactic modules. For convenience of analysis, Loge's vocal is moved to the top stave. As noted in the case of other such passages, an audience is only likely to follow Loge's melody line, and even then subconsciously. The supporting counterpoint reinforces this vocal while introducing elements the importance of which only the Meister can have intuited, since the texture knits itself together so that no individual line can be easily distinguished by the ear. Viewed separately outside the contrapuntal mix which renders them indistinguishable, however, they're striking even so, both in their support of the vocal and their look backwards and forwards through the surrounding modular evolutions, a snapshot of Wagner's mind hammering out his syntax. As is often the case, what seems a bewildering clutter boils down to a handful of key repeated modules, in this case chord note oppositions, reverse chord notes, chord notes, melody notes, reverse melody notes, Hagen's Day, and Ghosts of Ringlust. The Divisi Viola's top line juxtaposes reverse chord notes with their originals, an embryonic form which, by stressing the chord notes, is destined to yield the dragon syntax. First cellos echo this module at a parallax, then immediately repeat it. In support, second cellos intone two strophes of that surreptitious line from Fasold's contemplation of Alberich's previous offenses against the giants, which second violas echo at a parallax, a segment whose cadence resolves on a layered chord note opposition. No human ear can unravel this involved mixture from the passage's counterpoint, nor is it meant to. Rather, these elements are designed to support and reinforce the overt elements of Loge's vocal, since it's that which contains the most prominent syntactic clues. He begins by echoing the chord note juxtaposition in the orchestra, an idea the fire god then develops by repeating the rising-falling melody note opposition, which has only recently informed his initial plea for the Rhine Maidens, ending his panegyric. He caps his turn's melody notes by repeating them, doubled by the cello line, with their emerging sense of that mysterious racial change being gradually effected by Alberich through his interaction with the Rhine Maidens, which produces the ring, a concept intimately connected with the renunciation of love. Capping it, he inverts the melody note opposition, making it something akin to the giant turn, one of those embryonic ideas gradually taking shape as the epic progresses, here allied to the idea of who ultimately has a right to the gold, its Welterb, and all that ownership implies. To emphasize this subtle innovation, the strings fall silent for woodwinds to support him as they descend in three chromatic chords, English horn echoing the reverse melody notes, another precursor to much of the ring syntax. Spencer Millington's more precise translation, war gleichter ein eigen erlangt, tacitly acknowledges what Wotan already believes. In the measure following, the fire god's chord note module sidles down violas, cellos, two identical cell repetitions at the bottom of its arc, to preface his caution that it takes stealth to overcome Alberich's defenses. He leaps up a third into a reverse sash interval on chord notes, bounces down a fourth and up a third in a reverse distortion of that growing perception of the ring's power which ends in an inverted interval on an air to fourth, again on the word Alberich. Beneath these last two modules, a Rheingold fanfare rises in minor mode, on first horn, into a seemingly incidental passage, yet another close on the heels of his robbery advice, which advances several deep-rooted landmarks in the work syntax. This begins as expected with the woodwind viola ring pulse, intermixed in its rising second half with the Rhine Maiden's taunting module, reminding us of Loge's continued dedication to their plight, only to slide down with the briefest taste of resignation, a spear descent in cellos. 
quickly as this bundle trips past, meaning a falling rising sign corrected by a falling one, it nonetheless evokes that moment when Wotan's duplicity stuns Fasselt into silence, only to spark the giant's eloquent reminder to the god of where his true power resides, never mind the fire god's description of Alberich's mastery of the ring. What links these diverse passages isn't their individual syntactic modules, different in each case, but the arrangement of those into down-up-down down sine waves, a shape that pervades this segment of the argument. While Fasolt's earlier reaction first brutes this composite, it's the syntactic arrangement which gives it lasting significance, which indeed is built on two definitive morphemes, the ring and resignation. Loge's vocal, if more incidental, still has riches. For one, it outlines the down-up-down down patterns in the orchestra, hopping a low-ash interval on a third to fall on the Welter triad, lift an air to fourth, capped by a plunging octave, then rise in an identical low-ash interval to finally sink by doubling the orchestra in resignation, a morpheme which frequently gives this down-up-down down juxtaposition its syntactic sting. This intimates the hidden dangers in this new crime Photon contemplates, which first clarinet finishes with the ghost of the ring, its final cell leading it to what follows, particularly stressing its melody notes. Making good on that brief hint of the nymph's syntax, Loge uses its platform to initiate yet another appeal for the Rhine Maidens, his second in only a few minutes. Its air accords repeat twice on woodwinds, while adapted panegyric waves rock gently between first and second violins. Begun with a static ash interval, his vocal glides through an air chord note juxtaposition, shaped by a high ash interval that moves instantly into a low on an implacable yet winsome air to fourth, then a more leisurely static interval. Woodwinds increase their glow, the second violin's waves still twined with firsts, as he vocally doubles winds in that Rhine Maiden Coda module recently coined to end his panegyric, his voice stressing the chord notes which end it. This superb gentle swell peaks as a clarinet rises on a winsome tonic arpeggio through crisscrossing woodwind string waves to end on a trumpet's Rheingold fanfare. With its own low ash interval, the whole a tenderly mocking strophe of the Valhalla cadence, complete with falling spear bass on low strings, yet tellingly without its Freya cell, whom the gods would lose should they follow Loge's advice. The fire god's vocal surmounts this mix, rising then falling on fourths to leap up a fifth as violins, violas join in a sensual trill a pachitura, cellos adding a last wave. His vocal concludes with the turn from his advice on the ring's theft, truncated so as to focus on its reverse melody notes, the carrot of racial hegemony dangled before Wotan. Loge's vocal falls silent as first violins trip up a semi-quaver scale evoking the panegyric coda while interwoven triplet woodwind pulses, the nymph's laughter, segue into a comparable pair of air accords, supported by second violins caroling Rheingold waves. This sweet glow is punctuated by a pair of trill appoggiature, each time squelched by Wotan's contemptuous scoffs at what he dubs a ludicrous suggestion. His first phrase rocks up and down on air to fourths in a low ash interval, while his second rises a fourth from which it falls a sixth and rises on melody notes to outline Fricka's defiance at his own behavior now transformed into his at Loge's temerity. The irony is doubled as the goddess herself now chimes in to endorse her consort. Over horn bassoon pedal, a two-measure first violin trill appoggiatura marks the passage's contemplation of sexuality. First, clarinet takes the original lullaby tune's first segment, developing it in two rising strophes of its bounce, while Fricka voices her disapproval of this Wassergesucht on a damning inverted ash interval, falling in the most pejorative way on an octave. 
when her vocal traces the heroic melody notes to fall an equally ominous fifth. The first violin's appoggiatura ends by launching another trill on violas, this one lasting three measures. With it, clarinets, flutes whisper a pulse of Velgunda's erotic cry, the reverse ash interval with which she first lures Albrecht, followed by two bouncing strophes on that interval, then two more raised a third, and now spanning the air to seventh, to then repeat the bundle at this higher pitch. During it all, Fricka's accompanying vocal rises, then falls a third to plunge a damning fifth, then intone a static ash interval on the words, Mir zum Leid. At this point, violas conclude their trill on its appoggiatura by lifting a righteous octave, triggering flutes alone to take Velgunda's luring call, raising it three times by a third over a single measure's clarinet trill appoggiatura. Fricka, having bounced down the up thirds, sings an extended pulse of the robbery turn with its unique melody note juxtaposition, an indication her underlying motivation is that her consort should possess the ring and so quell these earthly races, including the giants, into the bargain, which can't be far from her mind. Her censure's wording implies the nymph's crime, Bülend, with Manchen Mann, confirms this doesn't include murder, a typical behavior of water nymphs in Teutonic mythology, but rather sexual congress. While the passage seems incidental, it's the tetralogy's first hint that a race exists in its cosmos other than gods, giants, nibelungs, or nymphs, never mind that sexual interactions have already gone on between them, something the Teutonic myths explore at length. Odin, the Norse Photon, is son of primeval giants who craft the earth from the corpse of a vast ice giant they've slain. As Odin and his two brothers peregrinate over the surface of this new world, they find two logs on the seashore and create from them the first male and female mortals, who give birth to all such denizens in Midgard, mythic name for the world's surface. Fricka's offhand comment, which hints the Rhine maidens engage in interracial breeding, subtly opens the door that much further to potential racial admixture, a concept already brooded in Wotan's defense of his worldly peregrinations, Fasold's affection for Freya, and Loge's comments on the marital aspirations of Donner and Fro, never mind Albrecht's interracial aspirations which launch the epic. The melody note juxtaposition in Fricka's concluding vocal is a module whose influence burgeons across the epic closely linked to the idea of stealing the ring's power from Alberich and all that deed's consequences for racial dominance. Fricka joins the silence of the rest on stage for a surprisingly extended coda to her scorn for the Rhine Maidens, as if the Meister leaves time for its concepts to percolate through the minds of the drama's characters and an audience. A single violin wave weaves around an oboe as it sighs an abandonment triad, which it caps as a treaty arpeggio to intone another trill appoggiatura, while clarinets take the rising trio of Velgunda's luring strophes lowered an octave. A last wave, this one on cellos, joins first horn as it descends in a heroic melody note reversal, after which bassoons take the luring bundle one last time an octave below clarinets, giving the module a decidedly sinister complexion. These few coda bars are more important than they seem at first glance or hearing. Stage directions portray Wotan as Sturm mit sich kämpfend, and part of that must be distaste at the ignoble prospect of robbing a dwarf. But another part of his unease is thought of Albrecht's sensual lust for the Rhine Maidens impacting the world's racial dynamic, a specter raised by Fricka's comment on sex relations between nymphs and mortals. 
the continuous progression of sevenths, not to mention the almost non-stop long short long world ash throb in Velgunda's taunts, intimate the immortal wrestles this ongoing and unsettling shift in his world's makeup even as the ring's wild card threatens him with still more immediate danger, wondering whether he shouldn't himself more aggressively join in this breeding lottery. While the silent gods mull, the giants act. Fafner assures a reluctant facile the gold is worth more than Freya, the goddess's sensual first half twice interwoven with a low woodwind minor seventh chord, its lingering semi-brevi followed by two crotchet pulses, another sly precursor of the Nibelung tattoo reminiscent of Loge's revelation of the gold's power. Vocally, the giant falls a third on Glaubmir, rests a crotchet for emphasis, then intones a high ash interval on a third to descend a seventh, Erda's inspiration goading him towards his ultimate doom. At this point, he slides down a minor second, meaning Erda chord notes, in tandem with the second set of woodwind pulses, making their movement Erda chords, the Earth Mother's hand further molding his thoughts. With the next two woodwind chord pulse, Freya mixes, Fafner sings an abandonment triad, confirming he means to forsake the goddess as their wage, which he caps with Velgoda's flavor of careless lust. He goes on to intone, Auf ewg jungen erjagt, wer durch golde sauber sie swingt. His crafty insight sung after a third bounce down, then up a tritone, a shadow of that module connoting lust for the ring. His unspoken implication is that, empowered by the ring, the giants can overthrow the gods and seize Freya. His vocal eludes through a falling sixth into a consecutive pair of defiant pulses, their embryonic sense of resistance to the god's agenda here made ever clearer, which he caps moving through a low ash interval on a second by rising a third into a plunging fifth and ascending fourth, yet another hint of that lusting cell. Supporting this entire vocal, the final woodwind chord rests on a four-measure pedal as the cello's last Freya iteration crests, then falls on a natural sign, only to turn back on itself as the woodwinds finish by breathing still more recognizable air chords. Portraying his brother's despondent, if mute, acquiescence, two horns repeat a sad, gentle strophe of something between the apples and the transitory adaptation of that morpheme in Fro's personal music, followed by a bass trumpet's Rheingold fanfare in forlorn minor. Beneath it, the two horns continue with reverse melody notes, their harmonized thirds piquant both with renunciation and its descendant resignation. First cellos add a pungent dissonance to the now holy brass harmony resolved by sliding down chord notes into one of the ring's rare full cadences, this one punctuated by three timpani Valhalla ash intervals. The overall effect of this hard stop of the colloquy following Loge's panegyric, one rarely underlined by stage action, is a significant period to its wealth of ideas. Per Porges, Wagner illuminated the meaning of the situation with the remark that now for the first time the gods realize that another power exists besides their own, namely the power of gold. This gold, thus released into the world, was originally the Rhine Maiden's charge, who, as Frick has only just reminded us, neglected it for their sexual frolics, which Buland with Manchenmann, we can only assume, must have at some point led to unplanned offspring. Along with gold, then, potentially unpredictable new breeds have been introduced into the world. The mysterious physical change implied now at work in the world at large finds its nascent voice in the mixture of melody notes, reverse melody notes, and those melody notes opposing bundles, with air chords, all of it intermixed with rising and falling triads, whose syntactic weight only increases as the tale unfolds, their power ultimately derived from the world ash interval, with its ever-present long short long strophes, and as primally the work's prelude. 
By divulging the secret of ring and gold in the giant's presence, the fire god assures not only their own avid desire for it, but also Wotan's reluctance to procure it on their behalf, shamed as he is not merely by these brutes with the upper hand, but the ignominy of thieving it on their behalf. It's at this point Fafner approaches the immortals, his call to the head god ceremoniously prefaced by an echoing pair of brusque low string cells. Porges reports Wagner took special care to emphasize the seemingly insignificant passage's intonation, feeling it important enough to include as a musical example. Nor is it without syntax. It begins on melody notes to conclude its first pulse on the abandonment triad, a detail which only recently informed Fasolt's irritation over the dwarves always slipping out of the giant's hands, and Fafner's immediately prior call to abandon Freya. Its second phrase trades the melody notes for reverse chord notes, and a third lift, but sinks from there to repeat the rising triad, and end with stout chord notes. After all, Fasolt is preparing to abandon his claim on Freya in favor of the gold, an action to have profound impact on the changing world of Rheingold, as shaped by Erda's dreaming power, never mind preparing for the choice Wotan will face between abandoning either Freya or the ring. As a last note, the brief passage also twice echoes the Rhinebeaten's bouncing lullaby module, suggesting the nymphs' perverse familial relationship to the giants as nature beings, never mind their unwitting complicity in the painful decision the immortal soon faces. This embryonic module here also exudes a powerful sense of vitality, a quality destined to inform its future uses in the epic. Giant thumps naturally preface Fafner's vocal, but with a subtly telling difference. Orchestrated typically, modules on octavo low strings and tonic dominant tonic pulses on horns bassoons, after three long short long strophes, it concludes with that defiant module which moments before Fafner has sung twice as he schemes at potentially taking the love goddess by force once the ring is in his grasp. His answering vocal, one a cappella measure, bounces on air to fourths, as in the giant's bass pulse, then up a third to repeat his defiance, or emphasis. Two giant strophes follow, viola supplementing the final major chord, whose sting, with second violins added, goads Fafner to promise the gods Freya. Again a cappella, he sings an odd ring distortion, concatenating its fragment into a single Weltherb triad, ended with reverse melody notes, a pungent reminder of Wotan's racial hopes. From it, the giant leaps up a fifth, a defiant pulse of Flossilda's heroics. As he caps it with a descending air to fourth, Viola's cellos echo him almost warmly, with this ring fragment distortion, which they end by rising an air to fourth, making theirs another crib on Flossilda. Taken together, the syntax is a gauntlet, thrown down before the god, its challenge initiating the next phase of their struggle for world domination. Driven by crotchet string chords on first and third beat, Fafner demands a new ransom, his voice sketching an extended version of the melody note opposition in its giant turn form, capped by a falling third, a direct contradiction of Loge's module when advising Photon on theft of the ring. After a crotchet rest, Fafner rises in air to fourth into strings gently pulsing giant thumps as he ascends in a low ash interval on a third capped after static notes by a threatening downward fifth. He then leaps through another low interval on a seventh to join low woodwinds in a dark outline of the unique dovetailed fragment reverse melody note module. His single measure's timpani roll giving it a subtle thrill, his vocal truncating it even further as he sketches only its Welter triad, ended with a reverse ash interval on an ominous fifth to the words Rotes Gold. Photon's outraged refusal, calling the giants mad while asserting he doesn't even possess the gold, implies he means to have it for himself, not them. 
His quasi-recitative retort initiates on Fafno's last note after an upsweeping contrabass cello flourish which leaves the god to sing a cappella, each phrase punctuated by harsh crotchet string chords. His first scoff, a version of the Rhine Maiden's bounce, from which, after a crotchet quaver rest, he moves through a chord note opposition on a triplet, then reverse melody notes, a static triplet, and an upward heroic fifth to end on a weird distortion of Friar love cell, Wotan already contemplating her betrayal. The giant thump answers in its wounded string brass incarnation, but a third long short long pulse solely on low strings eludes to a consecutive pair of defiant pulses in triplets reminiscent of those preceding Donner's prior threats that become heroic erda melody notes answered by Valhalla Part I on Horn's bassoons. Atop this complex, Fafner rehearses their toils, erecting the fortress, making Wotan's conquest of the dwarf seem easy by comparison. The giant's vocal rises a third to descend on a reversal of the heroic air to melody notes, capped by another falling third, then a bounce up a fourth, another echo of that unique figure hinting at the ring's allure. Valhalla syntax finished during his crotchet rest. Then, like Wotan, the giant continues virtually a cappella with another Welterb triad, which becomes a pair of defiant strophes punctuated by another low string uprush. With a reverse ash interval on a third, he rises through an abandonment triad, followed with Flosshelda's heroic resistance, reinforced by ending on a rising fifth. After a quaver rest, he sinks a third, then leaps up another fifth, yet another ringlust echo, into a Rhine Maiden bounce mocking that in the god's vocal, which the giant finishes with a reverse ash interval on an accusatory plunging fifth. Fafner's text during the syntactic complex reinforces his brother's earlier reference to Nibelung conflict, here saying their race has never bested the dwarves in Neidspiel, an archaic term for hostilities suggesting the Meister lifted this idea from an earlier 19th century work. Such clashes, however, are nowhere present in any prior mythic source. There, dwarves are for the most part benign and powerless, who occasionally trick giants but never battle them. This may seem a minor point, but the backstory implied has broad repercussions for the drama. It reinforces a fact already established that Nippelungs aren't constrained to the Earth's depths, as verified by Mima and Albrecht's later peregrinations in the upper world. More than this, not the giants but the dwarves apparently initiate these quarrels. This can only mean, in addition to Albrecht, there exist contentious Nibelungs with warlike natures capable of thwarting these far more powerful adversaries, dwarves whose threat will remain even after their tyrants fall from power. If so, this casts an entirely new light on everything to happen after Rheingold. Fafner's attempt at making a new deal ends in Loge syntax scampering down on low strings, a seemingly clear indication the Fire God steps in to diplomatically broker this new pact. But, goaded by shame and his own lust for the gold, Wotan shrugs him off. Sadly, most of those productions available on video ignore the small but telling detail. The video directors of 1992's Bayreuth and 2012's Lisieux do cut to the fire god, but without any decisive action on his part, while only 2016's Vienna production has Loki sidle up to Wotan only for the god to shove him away. Should this be dismissed as unimportant, it not only drives the fire sprite soon to come delight once the immortals are decimated by loss of their immortality, but also underlines how woefully they misjudge the impact of his power over their fates. In all events, Wotan bridles at Fafner's offer still more emphatically, his refusal laced with the nearest thing to curses. Unverschämt, überbegehrlich, dumme. His a cappella vocal first leaps up a fourth to run through five static notes including a static world ash interval, the phrase ended on a pair of chord notes amounting to reverse melody notes, punctuated by a rough crotchet string chord. 
led by rising third, his second phrase intones a triplet amid four static notes to end again on chord notes, followed by another string impact during his crotchet rest. He resumes with his longest unbroken phrase, falling a third into reverse melody notes to leap up a sixth on another string impact, thus describing Flosshilda's heroic resistance. He slides down from it on a spear scale, initiated in triplets, which, concluded by another rising sixth and punched by a last string chord, produces another Flosshilda pulse. From there, his epithets conclude on a triplet distortion of Freya's love cell. Fassel takes this chance to seize the unlucky goddess, as portrayed by ever more dense strings rushing wildly up a group of three bowed semiquaver minor seventh arpeggios. In claiming her, chord strikes crotchets, punches vocal. The horn reinforced string choir in Stetorian Divisi on the first beat of each measure. After calling to her on an initial rising third, followed by a quaver rest, Fassel jeers the giants have her in unserer Macht, with a low ash interval appropriately on an air to fourth. Rising that same fourth after another quaver rest to create an up-down fourth bounce that acquires heroic significance in Die Valkyrie, he falls a tritone into melody notes, producing Fricka's testy module. He completes his phrase on a ring distortion punctuated by two horn string quaver chords, an upward air to fourth separating its single velt herb triad from its extended melody notes. Taken together, this vocal syntax paints an exact portrait of the giant's rebellion in the name of his sexual needs, empowered by Erda, yet opposed by its own lack of integrity, all of this through his demands for the ring. Another three rising string arpeggios and bold semiquavers lace Freya's desperate cries, which she begins with the arpeggio's second measure, twice falling a third, then rising to a single cry of ve, a tritone above, each pulse harmonically raised from the last and separated by crotchet rests. Beneath her final note, an acerbic string crotchet launches Fafner barking the terms of ransom, which of course boil down to the gold, which had better await them come evening. A woodwind horn minim quaver pedal buoys his initial phrase, his static ash interval finished with melody notes. Punctuating him, the same woodwind horn chord twice thumps hard double impacts, recalling that similar effect during the brother's earlier outrage, the last sustained as a pedal, while his lust bristles through a low string trill apoggiatura, resolved into a harsh spear pulse, truncated after its sixth note along with the woodwind pedal by a sting across the string choir to leave only a timpani roll. Atop no more than this, after leaping up a heroic fifth, he proceeds into a duo of plunging sevenths, a ghost of scheming, whose interstitial notes trace an abandonment triad, Loge's covert manipulation bearing its first active fruit. He follows this after a minim rest with a velt herb capped by chagrin on another seventh, the whole another ring distortion. It also echoes Wotan's two earlier lines, Loge's manipulative ducks tidily in a row. Drawing a crotchet breath, he defiantly repeats chagrin, and following another crotchet rest, intones melody notes. Then, with a third crotchet rest, his next phrase traces a static ash interval followed by a second melody note strophe to fall a sixth, making it a third chagrin pulse. Beneath this last vocal, low woodwind's horns growl a first ring strophe resembling its second embryonic pulse from scene one. In this case, its fragment answered by an abandonment triad, which then hitches down a third to leap up a heroic fifth, the lusting cell. It then continues in an extended ring fragment, Fafner vocally tracing that last module on the words Rheingold, Licht und Rot breaking off on a heroic rising fifth, thus producing yet another ring-lust echo. Fasolt seizes the last word over the horn woodwind fragment's final notes, which, in the next measure, a rest in a low-register pedal enriched by second violins, violas, tremolo cellos, and sostenuto contrabasses. 
His voice leaps up a third to move through four static notes to chord notes, a line he immediately echoes, ratcheting up the tension by losing the third and lifting a harmonic second. His final utterance begins on reverse chord notes, which banish the hornwood wind pedal. Bass clarinet, bowed semi-quaver cellos, contrabasses, sostenuto, swell, and echoing spear reversal under the giant's dotted minim held note, who says he'll take Freya away für immer on reverse melody notes, both doubled and opposed by harsh quaver string impacts, his final plunging vocal fifth launching the giant's exit. Despite Fassel's outward ferocity, this is a happy moment for him who at no point in Rheingold cares for the gold, and later challenges Fafner for the ring only in outrage at his brother's greed. Freya is Fassel's sole obsession throughout, and per his own words, for the specific purpose of becoming her spouse with the implication he means to sire offspring on her. Per this exit sequence's prominent stress on reverse melody notes, felt air triads, and ring fragments. Another three wild bowed semiquaver scale arpeggios on low strings ascend in diminished minor harmonies as the protesting goddess is carried away. Her cries, two falling fourths, then a falling third, and rising tritone in a bitingly ironic echo of ring lust. After viola reinforcement on the third rising arpeggio, strings reverse on Freya's last vocal note into a series of five descending sextuplet quaver spear scales, consecutively raised a third in pitch. These underline Donner and Froh's impotent protests, the former echoing ring lust on a falling third and rising fifth, the latter a static ash interval, rising third and falling fourth, a kind of ring lust inversion. As they look to Wotan, who does nothing. Strings climax on a harsh but swiftly diminishing horn woodwind pedal joined after a half a measure by fingered violin tremolos as Freya's last two cries fade in the distance, descending a third, then after a minim rest, up the same interval, a single note which dies away as first oboe slides pathetically up Freya's sensual module, capped with an equally dismal chord note strophe. The giants carry away the goddess, exactly as, under Erda's orders at every turn, Loge has stage managed for them to do, who narrates their disappearance with relishing detail geared to intensify the god's suffering at her loss. This is yet another rape, akin to the crimes of Wotan and Albrecht, but in this case, the first one that's overtly sexual. The muscularity of the giant's retreat has everything about it of lust's haste, which Loge's description underlines in the rawest physical terms, a passage easily dismissed as mere scene painting, but which includes crucial syntactic landmarks. Launched by a muscular falling semi-quaver scale in low strings, this adds up to a mere four morphemes, continually repeated to depict the giant's dogged stride through the valley below. Parenthetically, it's worth repeating the Meister visualized his syntax cinematically. While the stagecraft of his day was unable to reproduce it in physical action, this passage represents the film which seems obvious in Wagner's mind's eye, effortlessly cross-cutting between gods and retreating giants. The bottom staff shows low strings, the middle alternating low woodwinds, as they sketch chord notes and their reversals, in that double impact form introduced by Fasselt's outrage at Wotan's duplicity. These also suggest scene three's dragon shape, turning on its head Newman's belief the syntax is proprietary to Alberich when it, at the very least, includes the giants. Especially apt at this moment, insidious repetitions of the giant turn regularly inform the low string line, echoed at an expanded parallax by the woodwind's double impacts, which conceal a pair of reverse melody note strophes as well. Most deeply buried, the double impact effect also hides a single pulse of Wotan's turn opposed to the giant's. Woodwinds finish by sketching a truncation of the last measure, as they lead to the entire sequence descending a harmonic minor second. 
This is more than scene painting. It's purpose to develop key threads as they spread across the epic, since the possibility Freya might fulfill the role of Fasolt's longed-for consort, thus spoil Wotan's racial hopes, is stronger here than at any other point in Rheingold. Logar's vocal establishes the giants hurrying roughly down the valley as he bounces up a fourth from static notes into a low ash interval on a third to create the heroic melody notes, then falls on that third into extended reverse melody notes. With a kind of poignantly muted sigh for the goddess's threatened natural purity, Horn's clarinets answered by leaping up an octave, followed seamlessly by a single iteration of air chords, a subtle reminiscence of the similarly endangered Rheingold. After an additional pair of echoing measures, the fire god describes the giants wading through the Rhine, falling on chord notes into a deliberate low ash interval that rises a third, only to be opposed by a shuddersome inverted on a tragic fifth, whose static notes extend until its concluding third bounce. From there he moves to painfully stark images of physical contact, which subtly alter the passage's syntax. Like the previous, this is largely dominated by three morphemes, reverse chord notes, chord notes, and dragon syntax, though here radically dovetailed. Meanwhile, Horn's oboes slide down a gloomy chromatic spear variant, its hint of resignation echoed in Logar's vocal as he begins on a reverse ash interval, the string woodwind complex beneath finished by a last giant turn. In the concluding two measures, a subtle evolution, or more accurately, a variant on that turn, follows twice, slightly altered to a sextuplet figure that ramps up the passage's urgency. It's a succinct mix of the melody note opposition whose presence reverberates through Rheingold's syntax from its first bars, a juxtaposition which grows more prevalent as the tale develops until it informs Loge's advice to Votan on how to seize the ring, and always to connote situations resembling this one, in effect dealing with the sexual urgency of those whose potential interbreeding may radically change this primeval world. Logar's vocal contributes to the syntax even after his sinking chromatic line describes Freya's distress, begun with a reverse ash interval. From there, he moves through a third bounce to a static ash interval, continued with Flosshilda's heroic vocal module, ended by a falling octave, a compact indictment both of the giants and Votan. In the way of its predecessor, it also hides reverse melody notes and that giant opposing turn. The sequence's remainder is built from these materials, each of its segments descending harmonically by chromatic half-steps, broken by numbers of measures into 4-4-2. Four, four, the first of these twice repeat this development's final two measures, after which low strings at a parallax with bass clarinet bassoons trade swift downward scales capped by rocking on fifths and thirds to create a pair of abandonment triads, which Loge echoes in Veltherb triads. After two measures, these modules trade between cellos and bassoons in chord note oppositions, which contrabasses maintain. In the course of this, Loge's vocal begins with a warning cry on a downward air to fourth, lifting after a crotchet rest that same interval into static notes, followed by that dragon-like reverse chord note opposition to ooze down chromatically on reverse melody notes. He then sketches two echoing modules built on an initial rising third, followed by a Veltherb triad, his second phrase repeating itself a third below, as both his words and the orchestra's decrescendo depict the giants and Freya disappearing from view, their unusual wedding possibly assured. His vocal ends, and another two measures of low strings slow by alternating the opposition thump with bassoons, finally terminated on a single pulse at half speed. We'll leave it here until the next video, which picks up where this one leaves off in Dover's full score on the third stave of page 142. As always, thanks for watching, and please do leave your comments. Time and energy allowing, I'll do everything I can to respond. 
Lastly, as all YouTubers know, your subscription to this channel by itself is a huge assist in completing this vast project. Hit the bell to be notified of the next videos. With luck and your support, there's a lot more to come.